this. So, oh, we can skip the intro slides. Uh, let, let me start with, with, with stating that, of course, the financial accounts have, have a long history in the Netherlands. We have been, well, working on the financial accounts for, for many, many years. And, well, that also explains, uh, like in, in the first uh, session this morning, that, well, we have now, uh, I think, a very well-advanced uh, system. But let me start with giving you some characteristics of uh, our accounts. Uh, uh, we have annual and quarterly accounts. So we also have quarterly financial accounts and balance of uh, quarter, quarterly accounts and financial accounts and uh, balance sheets. Uh, we have whom to whom matrices. Uh, we do fertility consistency checks. So also with the non-financial accounts and what other national accounts uh, subsystems. Uh, we have a system in which, or production cycle, in which we say, okay, if we have four quarters, that's our first preliminary annual estimate. Uh, we have an annual revision cycle for the financial accounts. And that basically has to do with the fact that for the financial accounts, and I think that was also addressed this morning, you often have new information coming in and not only, well, a few millions, but in the Netherlands, in some cases, it may change the figures for billions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we said, okay, there we should have a different uh, revision cycle and benchmark revision policy than the rest of the national accounts. Uh, so there we have an annual revision cycle, which of course does not imply that we completely revise the accounts every year, but we say, okay, for a selected number of topics where we know there's new information, we will impute that into the accounts. Uh, we have a joint responsibility with the Dutch Central Bank, so it's not only the statistical office who compiles the account, but we do it in close cooperation with the uh, Central Bank. We even, well, stated we have a joint responsibility. I will say something about that also tomorrow when we talk about the organizational models and the data we, uh, well, produce are used amongst others to fulfill uh, the transmission program for the European Union, so the European System of Council transmission program, uh, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, the MIP, which is in place in Europe, but also for the ECB, the Monetary Union Financial Accounts Data Requirements, the so-called MUFA, uh, and uh, actually we sent as a statistical office the data to the European Central Bank on behalf of the uh, Dutch uh, Central Bank. So those are basically a few characteristics of the uh, accounts we have. It's a... It takes a while. <laughs> that, that was my presentation. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Can you please? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so looking at the subsectors we we have in the accounts, uh, I'm, I'm not going to read them all, but here you can see that. Well, the the, the subsectors we have also reflects the composition of the uh, Dutch economy, especially if you look at the financial accounts. So, for the financial corporations which is a, a large part in the Dutch economy, especially if you look at financial accounts and balance sheets, they have lots of uh, subsectors. Uh, also for general government, we, well, we have the three uh, main uh, subsectors, central, local government and social security fund, but we have more detail on the lying those uh, accounts. Uh, and uh, two things I like to mention with these sheets that for household sectors, we well have been able to also go to distributional accounts in the Netherlands, so we can quite disaggregate the households to different household characteristics nowadays. Uh, has to do with the fact that in the Netherlands we are endowed with uh, lots data, uh, well, well, a rich data source. We can access all the. Uh, tax data, so the, well, the data I provide to the tax office on my tax return is actually also somewhere in Statistics Netherlands, like for all the other Dutch people, and we can use those data to, for example, to, well, disaggregate the wealth information in the financial accounts to, well, different households. And, well, for the non-financial corporations, we are working on subsectoring, so dividing the whole sector non-financial corporations into different subsectors. 
Uh, well, that are the basic characteristics of our uh, system. Like I said, well, that it has been the work of many, many, many years. Uh, and well, what, what's, well, for this session, what I tried to do, and that's what I also explained this morning, is that, okay, but how is this data used? So I tried to find examples uh, for, for well, how, what, what kind of policy use do we see of this information in the Netherlands and in Europe? So I tried for each of the uh, sectors uh, to find an example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but let me start with this. Uh, I'm always impressed by this number. I think in English, you have to talk about trillions, John. So 18 trillion euros, that's a lot of zeros. This is by far the largest number, which is in the Dutch national accounts. And this is the total assets held by Dutch uh, in total. So that's a really impressive number. Huh? If you compare it to GDP, well, you at least have to distract a few zeros. Um, next slide. Uh, and uh, what we have is that you can also see is, okay, how is this 18 trillion? Uh, well, uh, what, what is it composed of? And there you see that the majority is equity and investment funds, shares and units, but also a, a large proportion of loans, uh, the short term and the long term loans. Uh, but also debt securities and a few other ones. And this basically reflects the position the Dutch economy has in the world. Next slide, please. Uh, but now it works. Uh, because, well, like you know, the Netherlands is not a big country. It's actually a very small country. If you look at how many people populate this uh, very small space, uh, and it's also a very open economy. So we have, well, we trade a lot with the rest of the world, but also on the financial part, we see we have a lot of substantial financial links to the rest of the world. Uh, that results in a net financial world or worth of almost 800 billion euros, uh, which is the result of, and there we get to the trillions again, uh, to even larger, uh, well, total assets held abroad and total asset of total liabilities uh, we have uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and that's, well, producing these kinds of figures uh, gives an enormous insight of how the Dutch economy functions, also to our policymakers and also the understanding that, well, we do not only trade commodities and uh, good, or goods and services, but we also will have a large role in the financial system of the world. And that's what these figures really come handy. And, and what it also shows is because we have long time series that although we have a huge financial worth as the Netherlands, it also varies uh, over time and quite dramatically. So this is, well, you can read it better on screen than I can on the small screen. Uh, but here you can see how did this network changes. So you can see the change in assets on the rest of the world. You can see the changes in liabilities to the rest of the world. And they will nicely look like they have the same direction. But you can, uh, can also see the quite the heavy changes. So just before the financial crisis, we saw an enormous rise. And with the financial crisis, there was an extreme drop. And over the last few years under Corona, you see much more fluctuations and also going to negative values than we had ever uh, seen uh, before. So the accounts provide this kind of information, which is really useful to uh, our users. Uh, and well, the Netherlands is, of course, a country where we have a lot of foreign direct investment. Uh, has also to do with the tax uh, rules we have for the tax laws we have wouldn't go so far to say we're a tax haven then I'm, I will be expelled from the Netherlands but uh, well there are different tax laws in the Netherlands which facilitate foreign companies to reroute their profits or other investments uh, to the Netherlands so that also implies that the foreign direct investment is a well plays an important role in the Netherlands and well, here you can see it, for example, that, uh, well, if you look at the inward direct investment position, I think, well, the Netherlands is on top if you look at the US. Uh, and you can also see the income we generate from that. So we not only have the financial accounts and the balance, but we also have the related income flows uh, with that. And there you again see the, well, the enormous amount of the figure. So, well, it's 200 to, to 300 billion euros a year. Uh, those are enormous sums. And well, 
both the incoming as the outgoing flow, well, are actually the same, almost the same size. So the net balance is, well, not, not that big, but if you look at the gross figures, well, they, I always find them quite impressive for a country uh, like the Netherlands, because you have to realize that 215 billion euros is almost 30, 35% of GDP. So that's one example. The other example, and well, that's the government debt uh, in the context of the EU deficit procedure. Uh, well, there we can, for example, compile figures like this, where you can have the decomposition of government debt of, of total general government into the different uh, instruments. And well, there you can also see some very interesting uh, developments over time. Uh, again, if you look at 2008, the start of the financial crisis, when our government had to rescue a lot of the financial institutions, they had a real finance need. So what you see is that the red bar, the short term uh, debt securities are really rising because government had actually to finance all their rescue operations. And over time, it declined uh, a bit more. For the rest, well, you see the total, uh, well, development of uh, government uh, debts, including in the more recent years where, well, the, the corona and the measures taken by government, uh, well, increased the uh, demand for uh, money by government. So that's also an example of the data which can be derived from our national accounts. Um, then we have the macroeconomic imbalance uh, procedure, where one of the indicators where Netherlands is always in the red is the private sector debt. Uh, and of course, the private sector debt of the private sector has two components. Uh, the first one is the households, that's the blue uh, in this uh, graph. And the second one is the uh, financial corporations and the non-financial of the non-financial corporations. Uh, I think, John, the threshold is 200. I always forget. Yeah. And you see that, well, the Netherlands is constantly above uh, that line. And that basically has to do with the fact that we have a large blue section of this uh, graph, uh, but also with, with the orange because we have the well, the foreign direct investment uh, relationship and the tax uh, issues. Um, but if you look, for example, at the, uh, well, the blue line, that, that's very interesting because you see that in the Netherlands, the mortgages are qu quite high compared to the value of houses. So people are always worried in the Netherlands and also the international organization about how does that develop. And just to give you an well, a slight impression. What I did is I, I made two graphs. The first is the mortgages, the total amount of mortgages uh, held by households in the Netherlands uh, in the time series from 1999. Uh, and there you can see it almost tripled in uh, the, that time period. But, well, to, to put it in perspective, I also put in this graph the, uh, well, the development of the average price of houses in the Netherlands. And there you can see, okay, well, it, it's not the only explanation why mortgages are so high in the Netherlands, but it certainly well puts it into perspective. And this is, I think, the mortgage and the amount of mortgages in the Netherlands is one of the figures which I think is mostly used from the Dutch national accounts. I think it was the second quarter this year when we had to announce that the total amount of mortgages held by households has exceeded 800 billion euros in the Netherlands. Um, well, that's quite a number. Uh, but this is also information which it does uh, heavily used from our accounts. And to finalize, I'm looking at household wealth. And like I explained, we have distributional data. And I, well, I realized that this is, well, a, a very advanced step of compiling the financial accounts. But having done that uh, work, uh, well, that gave us two advantages. The first is that we could actually and like I explained, we have tax data available. So for every Dutchman, we have the information on their wealth, which they well uh, provide to the tax authorities. That helps us to really dis disaggregate the uh, household uh, sector, but also helped us to improve the uh, well the, the financial accounts of the household sector. Before we had that data, it was counter sector. So we knew the banks had deposits which were the uh, of households. That's how we uh, compiled the financial accounts. But with incorporating the tax data, we also got a second source to verify that. 
And for example, how that improved our accounts, uh, going back to mortgages, we took the mortgage data from the banks, of course, as a starting port, uh, point for uh, compiling the financial accounts in the past. And we thought, okay, that would be it. Uh, but when we confronted it with the tax data, we came to the conclusion that actually there are also other uh, institutions providing uh, mortgages to households, which are not part of the financial sector, or not, at least not part of the financial sector, which is uh, observed by the Dutch Central Bank. And that was, I think, about 20 or 25 billion euros. So that's quite a gap we missed uh, until then. So that, that really helped us to improve the data. And secondly, uh, what the distributional data helped us to do is also to address policy issues which are relevant in the Netherlands. And one of the, well, the, the issues which is high on the political agenda is the distribution of household wealth, for example. Uh, how much uh, does everybody own and how much is it distributed over different population groups? Uh, and, well, the government uh, had a special commission uh, earlier this year looking at that aspect, not only well, taking stock of what is actually the picture, but also, okay, what could be policy options to address those inequalities? And for that, we were, because we have this data, be able to well, provide them with a lot of new figures. And I explicitly made this very small print, um, but it's just to illustrate that we can now, well, quite disaggregate the financial wealth of households to accommodate, uh, well, policy questions and policy needs. Uh, and for example, well, you can, you can see the composition uh, per uh, quintile, even, even for the highest 1%, you can see how much wealth they own in the Netherlands. And that's, well, I, I think one of the app policy applications of our financial accounts and the distribution, distribution data, which really well show that there's a really a, well, a use and a need for these kind of data and policy because it really helps them to get a better view of what's happening in the, the Netherlands. So what I try to do with this presentation is to show a few of the policy examples which uh, are in the Netherlands. Like I said, uh, the lesson I take from uh, preparing this presentation is also with my staff to look, okay, how are we better going to promote the work we're doing in the financial accounts? Uh, and I hope this is helpful for you. As I said, I, of course, realize that we have a very advanced uh, system. Uh, but then again, this is also, well, information which shows what, what, what are actually questions we get from policymakers and how can we address those uh, with the financial accounts and balance sheet uh, data. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation, and I would like to hand over the floor to you. Yes, thanks for that, Gerard. Slides are coming. Uh, we decided that it would be better to just have these two presentations again together and then questions afterwards. Uh, the goal for my presentation will then be uh, sort of to present uh, the experience of a smaller statistical institute uh, with maybe a, a shorter history. Now you've heard from the Dutch with this, their long standing history. So now you can perhaps, uh, I can give you some insights from Iceland. So my presentation is divided there in three parts on back control uses, overview of figures and sort of the history of the accounts. I'm now regretting not putting in more figures after seeing the presentation before me, but okay. So to give you a little bit of a background, uh, the Icelandic population, um, as of the 1st of January this year was there 376,000 people approximately. We at Statistics Iceland, we are about 120 full-time equivalent. Uh, and within the Department of the National Council of Government 
of national council and uh, government finance, we are 20, 22 people thereabouts. And so, and with um, only me really doing a financial accounts production. Well, I, I'm the responsible for, for the general accounts. There are more, of course, I, I sort of get pieces, bits and pieces from, from other departments and uh, um, other places. You will see that in my next presentations. I have, I have three presentations, so I'll, I'll try to sort of join them together over these days. Uh, our financial accounts, uh, they have their, yeah, about 1600 time series. If you count each instrument for each sector individually, um, there are 21 sectors in total with all subsectors. Now I'm counting assets, the asset and liability side as well. Nine instruments, if you include total assets and liabilities or, or net uh, financial worth, uh, the stock positions and then transactions, revaluations and other flows, which we sent to Eurostat. Uh, these accounts are sort of uh, secondary product maybe, and they're, they're always in, uh, they're in constant development. And they're maybe on the younger side, you'll see that in my last slide. But the role is, there you can see an overview of the role and uses. And this is maybe an echo of the previous presentations. Of course, it's to reflect uh, the makeup and structure of the financial system and the economy in general, and to be able to compare with our peers. Um, these statistics are used in, in financial stability reports and regarding macro approval. Um, there are inputs into various macroeconometric models of the economy. Uh, I know the, the central bank has one and they take some figures from us. Uh, we also have our own model. Uh, I've heard that these are used by the rating agencies, big international rating agencies. Uh, for estimating uh, or to, to give rating to sovereigns. Um, and also various analysis. We receive sort of inquiries, various queries every year. Um, okay, coming to the overview of the figures. So here uh, I've shown, I'm showing you uh, total financial assets and liabilities of the domestic sectors only. And so the difference there between assets and liabilities would then be the, the net foreign position. Um, and these are ex massive figures as well with a lot of zeros. Um, so really the only way, way of viewing them is, is in terms of GDP. There you can see maybe uh, the rise of the banks prior to the great crisis, the Icelandic banks, and then the, and then the fall, and then the sort of steady decline of financial assets and liabilities. At their height, there were around, yeah, 20, 25 times GDP uh, in Iceland. I believe the, yeah, the fall of the Iceland banks is, is quite famous now. Um, Oh, yeah. And we are also able to, of course, show the makeup of the, the assets and liabilities as well. And, and the weight of each sector here, I'm showing you uh, the weight of each sector assets on the asset and liability side. And you can see the change over time. Uh, the financial sector S12 is sort of half. It's got 50% of everything on both asset and liability side. And then we see the non-financial corporations as 11. Uh, the government has a steady percentage sort of throughout time as 13 there. And households, their assets and liabilities have varied through time. There's a steady increase now since, since the crisis, which is quite interesting. Um, 
and if you just look at one sector so so these are this is the, the financial sector in general um, and the subgroups the nine uh, sub sectors and how uh, and and their asset holdings there and you can see the importance of the pension funds in the Icelandic economy they are extremely important and then of course um, the as 12 2 the deposit taking corporations and there as 127 uh, holding corporations they which which hold a lot of assets so this sort of the financial accounts give you a good idea give policy makers a good idea on where to look and analyze in more detail and looking at the household balance sheet for uh, 2021 we see that the vast majority of assets are actually uh, there the insurance technical reserves these are pension holdings pension assets of the household so we see that their savings uh, come a great deal from from the pension system on the liability side they have uh, of course their main liability are their mortgages and and something other smaller there as well they do have some some uh, shareholdings uh, currency and deposit so they are quite liquid actually and this sort of gives you a uh, overview at a glance of the of the uh, Icelandic financial accounts and these are just examples on you know what you can take from the accounts uh, here i've supplied you with a small history of the financial accounts in iceland so maybe you can see there that it is quite shorter following the following the great crisis the great financial crisis of course the need for economy wide uh, financial accounts was very apparent and there the, the work sort of started uh, we were producing this internally uh, but the financial crisis made the compilation very challenging of course it's very difficult finding market value when there is no market um, for assets specific assets uh, and so there uh, around 2010 we made our first mou memorandum of understanding with the central bank um, the statistical office and this is really sort of the the start of the accounts and you will hear later uh, that i more about the mous and i cannot uh, understate the importance of having one actually i believe this is really the way forward for countries Having a having a memorandum of understanding between the statistical institution and the central bank. Uh, so there are more milestones in 2014. The ESA 2010 was implemented. So so uh, the accounts in its current form were more of more or less made there. More instruments added. More sectors. Um, in 2017, we updated our our MOU. Uh, and our balancing procedure was revisited as this as there's more focus on this now and initiated more regular working meeting meetings with the central bank and and this more on this later and in the near in the near future um i mentioned at the start that these are actually only annual accounts we have uh, quarterly accounts in some form the central bank is is uh, publishing on s12 an overview way of of uh of s12 we are producing now and releasing probably soon uh, quarterly accounts for the for the government now in a, in, the, in this financial account format we have a, an older accounts in a slightly different format um, and of course we always want to uh, automate or try to automate more tasks and integrate uh, so looking at vertical discrepancies and stuff like that really tackle that in the near future 
this was all that I prepared, as I said. But um, thank you for your time. And now it's time for questions for the both of us. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Owen. And indeed, now it's time to, uh, to ask any question you like to the both of us. Thank you very much. The presentations were great. If we look at them, we can immediately tell what was going on in your financial markets, how they evolved. And I have a question. You have rich history of uh, compiling financial accounts. Could you tell us, in case of uh, having this practice, did you compile base basic uh, financial accounts first, uh, having the available information? And you should have had the information on the external sector. You should have had some banking sector. And the rest is evaluations of households and non-financial corporations. We ask about basic financial accounts. They are mentioned in the monetary credit statistics that at the first stage, the countries may compile the basic financial accounts. Did you have this practice? And if yes, could you share the examples? If not, then we'll look at some other approaches. Was the question for me or for my oh, oh. I uh, believe it's the question to both presenters. So do you have the information? If you have the information, then it's probably for you. I think you have this information because you know about uh, this compiling of accounts. Thank you. Yeah. You want to yeah. give me a start? Yeah. Okay. Then, then I'll kick off. Uh, um, let, let me, I, I do not have that long history with the Dutch statistical office that, that I can say something about the annual accounts, but I was involved in, uh, well, well, developing the quarterly accounts. And there you see that what we actually did is, well, we, we started with the information we had. And that was, of course, not a full set of information. So uh, for, for the quarterly accounts, we, we, well, we had a quite a rich set of information from general government. Uh, because we, in the Europe, we also have the uh, EDP procedure. So there, a lot of the information was developed also for large parts of government. It was very easy to compile the quarterly accounts. Uh, what we also had is that we, are, we, we have a close cooperation with the central bank. And they, of course, have a lot of information on financial institutions, for example, from their supervisory tasks. And using that information could also easily be fed into the development of, of quarterly accounts. And I think basically, well, that those were the two first sets of data we had when we started compiling the uh, quarterly accounts. And then we, of course, realized, okay, for the non-financial corporations, we should do something and we should get information on that. So that's where we started a survey. And basically at the start for households, we had no independent information. We used the information from the financial uh, corporations as information also to estimate the household sector, for example. But gradually that evolved and then we got information from the tax authority, like I explained, for, where we, for example, for the wealth of households, all of a sudden had independent estimates, which could be confronted with the information from the other sectors. So that gradually step by step or baby step by baby step led us to, well, further develop the accounts. And with that, we're now at the stage where I think we have a full mature set. But even at the beginning with the only limited information, we were able to compile accounts, which actually provided insights into uh, the economy on the part of financial accounts and balance sheets. So I hope that answers your question. And I can imagine that for the, for the annual accounts, uh, the same thing happened, uh, but then I really have to go back into history. So I cannot answer that, but I guess it was almost the same. Yeah, it's a similar experience in Iceland. Um, we, of course, started uh, with what we had, tried to draw upon the information that we already had. Uh, we, we are using a lot of registry-based data. Uh, we have very good registries, actually. So 
already from the beginning we can get a good overall maybe uh, sense of uh, magnitudes and totals um, uh, for it, uh, delineation of, of instruments maybe where uh, the central bank comes very strong um, there with their with their data from the financial sector um, but we're always sort of adding more uh, more coverage more sort of uh, sub instru more instruments and sub instruments and in the near future more more sectors as as more sub sectors will be coming I'm hearing um, but I wasn't at the start when the financial accounts were first made, but, but, but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't like just boom, everything ready. So it's, of, of course, it's a, it's a process. Does that answer? Okay. Yes, also an additional question, if you don't mind. You mentioned that in the beginning, when you compiled financial accounts, you had a good set of data on the government sector. Did I understand you correct? This set of data on the government sector, you probably used at least four main reports. There is a report on transactions of public sector, which repeats the specificity of financial accounts, because in this report we see the changes, in particular in some points in the cross-section by the instruments. And I believe that to this report you created some additional intermediate reporting, because anyway, there is more consolidation than what is needed for financial accounts. Could you elaborate on this one, please? Or it's a detailed discussion, which is too de detailed. Actually, it's a very interesting question, at least for me, because now we're compiling these financial accounts. This is why I'm asking so many questions. And we have many questions to Central Bank. And you say that uh, Central Bank is the key player. Yes, it's true. It's one of the biggest players, but the government's sector information is as important to how to systematize all the information in the beginning based on the government finance statistics uh, guideline of 2014. There are four main reports where you can uh, review all this, or do we need to compile additional sets of intermediate reporting, which will allow to improve the quality of compiling of this financial account? Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer your question. It's been a while since I've been in uh, government finance. That's actually where I started my career in statistics, Netherlands, some 15 years ago. Uh, but, but for go the general government, the situation at the start was also, of course, very different if you look at the various subsectors. If you look at central government uh, in the Netherlands, and I think that that holds for many countries, a lot of information is regularly available and can be easily or without much effort be transferred into the data needed for uh, national accounts financial accounts and balance of payments uh, of, of the, uh, the the uh, the the so that can be easily transferred uh it, it, where we really struggled in the Netherlands at the start, so 15 years ago, was uh, local governments, uh, where we saw that, okay, every local government, so municipalities, provinces, and, and you name it, they all had a different accounting system, they all had their own rules, they all had, all had their own uh, supervision, uh, they all had their own uh, financing arrangements, and Basically, that also well implied that at the start of the accounts, that part of the financial accounts was quite what, what could surprise us on the outcome. And that actually happened, uh, I think it was in 2003, when the Netherlands all of a sudden uh, passed the uh, European threshold uh, of 3% uh, uh, of a GDP deficit, where, well, basically, that was the result of what the local governments were doing. And, uh, well, it surprised us and but the main advantage of that surprise was that also central government then woke up and said okay 
we have to do something about this data situation in the Netherlands for local governments. And there where they asked us, okay, can you please help us? And there we now have a new system for information in place, which we, because they asked us, could fully align with the requirements we have for, for example, for the national accounts and the financial accounts. Uh, but in, at the start, that really was not the case. So it's also, well, experimenting, adding new information and take opportunities which, which arise to uh, further improve the accounts. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, good answer. I understand that actually going back to what Emmanuel mentioned in the beginning, we need to discuss, we need to establish platform to understand each other. And then we need to try to look at how well we compile all this. And here it's very important to understand the sources of data, which you mentioned, the data sources and how to expand them, uh, how to digitalize them and how to some sport approaches. Maybe it will depend on specificity of country and development of the financial markets by sectors. What are the instruments? Thank you very much. You were able to answer okay, my question. Thank you. Uh, and, 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 and it's true eh, that, that I think uh, e even now we're still looking at new sources. And uh, for example, I didn't elaborate on that, but we're working on subsectoring. And there you see that we're also looking at what information is publicly available. If you look at modern technology, a lot of information is easily available on the web and companies publish a lot of data. And you can also look at, okay, how can we use that data, for example, to, well, enhance the quality or uh, of our accounts or even make distributions into our accounts. So even there you see further developments, but like you said, it's country specific. The country situation may differ uh, or vary uh, extensively and that requires, of course, a country solution. But we can also learn from each other, because if I found a solution that might help you as a country, or if you do something the other way around, that might also help me to uh, improve my account. So that exchange of knowledge and, and experiences really helps, uh, I think, us as a national accounts and financial accounts uh, community. Would you like to say something, John? Maybe I'll add something. <clears throat> Yeah, I think with uh, particularly with government, but also with non-financial corporations as well, um, it's it's useful to understand their accounting approach and the chart of accounts that they're using. They call it a chart of accounts. Many of you will be familiar with this. So in, in fact, what you're basically doing is looking at their internal accounting structure and seeing and picking out the positions and the and the flows within that that are relevant for your accounts and trying to, to pull it out. Um, so uh, that's something where, uh, as Harrod rightly said, um, that develops over time. The chart of accounts is never kind of static. It's normally updated by the Ministry of Finance or by the individual authorities. And it's a question a little bit, not just of understanding it from the start, but also maintaining it over time. And that's uh, that kind of maintenance approach, which is actually uh, a big investment that you have to make continuously. Uh, as government evolves or as uh, a company evolves, it, its its own accounting will evolve and you have to reinvest to keep following it. You can't just take a, a snapshot from 20 years ago and keep following the same. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Any other questions? Just a quick comment, if I may. Just a quick comment. So the point is that now we're also developing financial accounts and in order to engage all counterparties in the market, we develops the regulation on interrelations. And under this regulation on interrelations, we build all possible interrelations between financial and monetary credit statistics. We understand that financial statistics is much wider. And by the way, in the guidelines on balance of payments, on GFS, on uh, public debt, there are all the transitions where all the items can be included into financial accounts or which ones should not be included. And there is a table which helps to move into the directions which are necessary. Now we took the way of these comparisons. And by the way, in my view, as a banker, 
I believe it is the most efficient approach to move in the direction of compiling the financial accounts. And now we think about that methodological framework is evolving and experimental calculation. We treat it from the position that we need to first try to build the basic financial accounts on the basis of available information and available information is balance of payment data, the GFS data, and the data on the rest of the world. Regarding households, we have service of households and we have statistics on non-financial corporations. We think that we will move in this direction. We will use these interrelations. I'm saying this because for many colleagues, it may be helpful. All these guidelines, which were established by IMF, OECD, World Bank, there are these approaches. And I like this option because everything is breaking down very well how it will be in GFS, in the monitoring credit statistics, and in the external sector statistics, everything is available. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, intervention. No, no online. Can, can we ask now? <laughs> yes, uh, Gerard and Orn, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really very informative and useful in my opinion. And uh, in your presentation, Jared, you've shown us uh, all statistics that you have on household uh, data. And could you please elaborate a little bit uh, about uh, data sources of household and uh, NPS sector? I don't know, maybe you already answered or not uh, mm -hmm. during the previous uh, questions, but I am interested in household and NPS uh, sector data, data sources. Um, yeah, thank you. I believe it was Derek Gordon to me. Thank you for the question. Uh, the household uh, data is uh, centered around tax data for the yearly accounts. And then we supplement it with uh, counterparty data from the financial sector, mostly. That's the same with NPISH. We, we get a lot of... Uh, positions from the of NPISH from the banks themselves. There are great data source there. Is there anything more specific that you had in mind? Or? So you you have uh, the list of uh, NPISH uh, sector organizations or list of organizations that uh, you apply to the sector? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, we do have a list of NPs, but we get, uh, we ask the bank, uh, I believe the, the central bank in their, um, in their data queries to the banks, ask them specifically um, for themselves to identify those. And we'll maybe discuss this probably tomorrow, but this has sort of shown that there's maybe a need of a, of a general registry for sector classification, uh, which we currently, it's not a, a public registry. Uh, we have one internally, but your question does touch on an important point, very important point. Um, but yeah, yeah, the banks sort of provide those separately. 